Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a uh, fantastic day. I'm here today with a surprise guest uh, and somebody that I have been uh, wanting to talk to for quite a long time. It just took a while to um, arrange due to different circumstances and because uh, he himself is obviously a um, very busy man. I'm here today with uh, Dr. Gadsad, who is a uh, professor of marketing at uh, Concordia University in Canada, uh, former holder of Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Science and Darwinian Consumption. Uh, many more titles. He's also uh, author of several books, including a very interesting one that I like very much, uh, The Parasitic Mind, that I have here with me. I strongly, highly suggest that you read this book. It is full of very nice ideas, very uh, wonderful ideas that also have a very um very very simple and good flow to them that are uh you know easily understandable without uh over complicating things which i think is something that makes uh dr gadsad also very uh unique in academia but i could talk forever dear uh dr gadsad how are you doing oh such a pleasure to finally be with you i know as you said that uh, it's been a while that uh, this has been forthcoming so i'm uh delighted that I'm finally here. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you. Uh, what do you want me to call you? Do you want me to call you God or? Uh... You could call me God or you could call me God, whatever you feel. But if, if it's Bostonian accent, God becomes God. So it's up to you. One I exists, just... the other one we're not so sure of. Yeah, yeah. I, I just had this tendency to uh, say, dear God, like that's that's how I, that's how it starts. <laughs> I, th I think my first email to you was actually uh, actually started like that. Dear God. <laughs> <laughs> so um i have a f i have a few questions that i want to ask first off was the introduction okay do you find it acceptable are you offended by it or do you want to I'm, I'm, I'm i'm very very offended i will be reporting you to the proper authorities but otherwise we can still proceed that's fantastic i appreciate that i accept that uh now first question i'm a little bit surprised uh it seems like you are an accomplished um uh, academic an accomplished uh, professor uh a doctor and all that but um i learn nowadays we learn now nowadays that um terrorism for example is something that has nothing to do with uh, ideologies and with certain ideologies it has to do with the fact that people come from marginalized uh backgrounds and you know lower standards and this and that now um if i captured it correctly you are um a jewish person from lebanon you experienced the civil war in lebanon uh you were heavily marginalized and oppressed there you fled that country came to canada found freedom here but you are still to a certain extent uh mar marginalized so i want to ask you uh a question that surprises me why are you not engaging in terrorist activity <laughs> well you don't know maybe <laughs> Maybe just me sharing all the opinions that I do is a form of intellectual terrorism. So, you know, some people head off to Raqqa to throw, uh, you know, gay people off rooftops as a form of male bonding and adventure seeking. Some of us write books. It's all forms of intellectual terrorism. Don't be a bigot. That is true. I, I didn't think about it that way. I think you did terrorize me through your book a little bit, I have to admit. Uh... <laughs> Um, your book starts with that, uh, jokes aside, it starts with that, uh, with, with your backstory and your background in, uh, Lebanon. And, uh, I found that part actually very, uh, fascinating, touching. It brings a good context to, uh, to why you are talking about the things that you're talking about. Um, remind me, so you, you were born and grew up in Lebanon, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was born in Lebanon, grew up there. Uh, we were part of the last you know, remaining Jewish community in much of the Middle East, but certainly in Lebanon, uh, even though in Lebanon, you know, there had been somewhat of a Jewish presence, it became more and more precarious in the 20th century to be Jewish, even in the context of, quote, progressive and tolerant Lebanon, so that we were, you know, much of my extended family had left by the start of the Civil War. So uh, in 75, the the, the metric by which all future civil wars are measured, which is the Lebanese civil war began. And so we were stuck. We were part of the last group of Jews that had remained in Lebanon. It, it was now completely impossible to be Lebanese and Jewish in Lebanon. And so we experienced the first year of the civil war. It was a 
it was something that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemies. And uh, subsequently, and this is something that I briefly touched upon in the parasitic find, my parents, even after we came to Canada, they kept returning to Lebanon until 1980, at which point uh, they were kidnapped by Fatah and uh, some really bad stuff happened to them and so on. But luckily, they were able to be uh, freed and rescued. And so, yeah, it was a pretty bad uh childhood growing up now prior to the lebanese war uh you know uh starting uh people might wonder you know so how how was it to be jewish in lebanon and that's also something that i discuss in the book the idea is that yes uh you know we weren't uh, under imminent threat uh prior to the civil war but the undercurrent of genocidal hatred of the jew was in every nook and cranny of society right so it's not so so you know you you had this secret that you had to uh you know somewhat hide now people could of course find out that you were jewish they just had to go to the synagogue on you know saturday morning to know that you're jewish but you didn't advertise it you didn't wear a big star of david you know it was you know be jewish but be quiet we're tolerating you but don't be obnoxious and of course as i said in the book the genocidal Jew hatred is everywhere. If you get diabetes, it's because the Jews did it. If it's sunny today, it's because it's the Jews did it. If it's rainy today, it's the Jews who did it. If your wife cheats on you, it's because some Jew put that in her mind. Uh, you know, I, I remember one time when I was maybe eight or nine years old, the teacher asked us to get stand up and say what we want to be when we grow up. And, you know, one person gets up, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a, a, a soccer player. And someone in my class who was supposedly a friend of mine said, when I grow up, I want to be a Jew killer. And everybody laughed and clapped. So this is the world that I grew up in. When I was five years old, when uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser died, the Egyptian president, the Pan-Arabist, uh, the president of Egypt, uh, there were demonstrations in, in uh, Beirut, as there always is, where, you know, people are angry about something. Uh, in Arabic, you say muzaharat, that this is like a type of procession, uh, you know, protest in the street. And, uh, you know, one of the chants that I remember as a five-year-old hearing is, you know, death to the Jews, death to the Jews. This was, ha what, what did I have to do with the Egyptian president dying? But I knew that there were a whole bunch of people walking down my street screaming death to the Jews. So it's in that context that I grew up, uh, always knowing that, you know, I was different. And this is why when at when when we left Lebanon, I mean, literally the day we left and we were flying out of Beirut. And I, I, I describe again the story in the parasitic mind. And, you know, many people have written to me saying how touching it was. And I appreciate that. Uh, as the captain said that we were out of Lebanese airspace, my mother put, uh, you know, Jewish insignia. I, I can't remember if it was a Star of David or a high symbol, which is uh, another Jewish symbol, but I think it was a Star of David. And she said, now you can wear this and be proud and not hide your identity. So it's in that context that I grew up. So when people say, oh, Lebanon, you know, it was progressive and tolerant, it's progressive and tolerant by the standards of the Middle East, not by that which we hear about today, diversity and inclusion. Yeah, you hear often um, these uh, comparisons that uh, that Lebanon is like the, um, what, what did they say, the Paris? Of Paris of the Middle East, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Paris of the Middle East, and um, but only to a certain extent, I mean, we 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 know the history. It was it was one of the largest uh, conflicts over the in, in the last um, last half century. Um, how did that come about, though? I mean, it's it's like um, you you describe how uh, you coexist uh, with others in this society, and it is kind of an open secret that you are uh, Jewish. You are not supposed to talk about this. You are supposed to keep a low profile, uh, and there is this constant looming. Uh, you know this 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 fear that anything could happen any time now things could start going really bad for us any time now and you will you are living with this constant fear and then in the end um over certain disagreements it exploded and uh many jews like yourself had to had to flee the, that nation to find refuge here I, I think you have never you haven't been to lebanon in I, i've never been back to lebanon and i you know, I so regret it and for several reasons. Number one, 
you know, I regret that Lebanon is this film that's in the back of my mind that I can no longer access. It's almost as if I saw a, you know, a spaghetti Western movies in the 60s with Clint Eastwood. That's how my life feels like. You know, you want to go back and actually see that where you grew up, the school that you went to. You want to concretize this. Also, I have children and I regret the fact that notwithstanding the horrors that we went through, uh, we are Lebanese. Uh, I am, Arabic is my mother tongue. Uh, I am as much Lebanese as anybody else from that region. Probably my ancestors have been there most than most people have been there. Uh, and so I would have loved for my children to be immersed in Arabic culture, to, to speak Arabic, to, you know, I would have loved that you know, maybe we have a home in Lebanon where I can go back. So for all sorts of reasons, I regret that uh, that tie has been broken. Now, I have been invited back to Lebanon, you know, as I gain prominence in life, people have wanted me to come back. But you might imagine why I've been tepid to accept any such uh, invitations. Maybe one day, as we say, inshallah, uh, it will be better and I can go back and there could be love and peace. But, you know, it just takes one idiot and then your life is over. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the future um, of of Lebanon? It it seems like people kind of uh, try to establish this peace by not talking about things. I have actually this this uh, interesting memory. I uh, I lived in Turkey for over ten years, and there I was uh, in um, I was in in business. I was an international expansion manager, and I had to meet with uh, different people from different countries. And uh, once I met with a uh, a group of business people from uh, Lebanon. That was the first time that I had contact with people from Lebanon. I, before that, I always thought it looks like a very interesting country, like uh, a lot of uh, a variety of cultural you know, of, of art and cultural uh, stuff that is coming out of Lebanon, which you don't see very much from other countries in the Middle East. Uh, when I sat down with these people, um, with these Lebanese people uh, for, for dinner, and I had a conversation about just the world and everything, I asked them about their 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 backgrounds. You know, <laughs> I said, uh, so what is your, uh, what is your, you know, your, your, your ethnic or cultural or religious background? And suddenly, um, it was three people. They all kind of uh, awkwardly lowered their head and said, "Oh, we don't, we don't like to talk about those." Well, things. I'm surprised that you, as as you were saying that you asked them that question, I was surprised that you did because, in the Lebanese context, that's a well, or even in the Middle Eastern context, that's a deep faux pas. Uh, and I'll tell you a, a few. I'll, I'll begin with one quick story to speak to that. Uh, many years ago, of course, before I was married, you'll see in a second why I'm saying, of course. Uh, I had been set up on a, a date with a Syrian woman. Uh, her husband was a professor of engineering, I think, at University of Damascus, but they, they had also uh, emigrated to Canada. And I met uh, the parents uh, at a party. And, you know, on paper, I looked like an ideal candidate. I was a young guy. I was a professor uh, on paper. Boy, I looked like a catch. Now, there was only one problem they needed to find out what my religion was. And they, according to them, there were only two options. I could be Christian or I could be Muslim. Now, they were Syrian Christians, a, a rare a rare group. And they needed to make sure that I wasn't a Muslim. And so when I went out with the daughter, who, who was a very beautiful uh, young woman, uh, the conversation was exactly not unlike the one that you had with the three people because she had to find out what my religion was without asking me directly. But it was so transparent and so ridiculous the way she was trying to find out. And that's all she was interested in. So when we went out on maybe two or three dates and the only thing that she was doing was to try to find out. So I kind of played along and I kind of, uh, you know, uh, in Arabic you say, stalemta, like I, uh, I was kind of trolling her because I knew what she wanted, but I wouldn't give it to her. So for example, if she said, oh, so how, where do you celebrate Christmas? I would give an evasive enough question that she would not know, she wouldn't get an answer. So after a few dates, we were sitting at this beautiful uh, tea house, co coffee shop tea house. And I looked at her uh, and I said, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've known all along what you've been trying to find out. And of course she feigns like in a very Middle Eastern, what, me, what do you mean? I don't know. 
I said, you, you, you want to know what my religion is? No, never, me, never. I said, well, I'm going to make it easy for you. I am your parents' worst nightmare. Because what, what, do, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, well, just, I mean exactly that. I am your parents' worst nightmare. So she goes, what do you mean? You're, you're, you're Muslim, right? I said, no, much, much worse. <laughs> and then she couldn't, she, she just was, her brain was exploding because she couldn't find an, another option. She didn't even know of another option. I said, no, I, I asked her to come like this, which is kind of a very ironic Arabic thing. I said, come closer. I said, I'm Jewish. Now, you know, in cartoons, when the, the, the cartoon ca character runs so quickly that there is smoke that pops up, that's what happened with her. And then as, we, as I was driving her back to, to her parents' house, it's as if she was trying to jump out of the car before the car stopped because she was so desperate to get out of the car. Now, this was someone who was Christian, Syrian, and yet had this. And so she goes to me, you know, good luck to you as I was leaving. I said, you mean with my disease? And so this is the kind of reality that you have. Do I have time to tell one other quick story before you come? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead definitely. So when I was a doctoral student first semester at uh, Cornell University, I met up with a lot of Arabs. And, you know, because I was Lebanese and spoke Arabic and so on, and I was a very good soccer player. So we connected. So we would hang out and we would go out and so on. And of course, I mean, they were all, most of them were Muslims. A few of them were Christian. So one day, one of them, I won't mention his name, although I'm not sure he deserves, he deserves that uh, courtesy, uh, invited me out uh, for a coffee. This is in Ithaca, New York, where Cornell is. And we go out. And so we sit down and he goes, uh, you know, he pauses very early in the conversation. He goes, you know, Gad, I really like you. You're a very, you're a very cool guy. I said, but you know, why, why do you say that? You, you, why are you surprised by that? Is it, is it because I'm Jewish? He goes, well, no, come on. I mean, you're not a, you're not a Jew, Jew guy. <laughs> no, no, no. I am a Jew, 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 Jew. He goes, no, come on. You know what I mean? So in his mind, I wasn't the stereotypical default value of a Jew. I was Arabic. I spoke Arabic. I was, yes, I mean, I was Jew, but not Jew, Jew. Now, this was a graduate student at Cornell University, right? It wasn't the guy in Raqqa who can't read, who joins ISIS, right? It's the elite, but yet he couldn't extricate himself. I, I could probably keep you here for another 10 hours to share, because oftentimes what happens is when I meet people and we speak in Arabic, they can never presume who I am. And so therefore the floodgates open up because they're not monitoring what they are saying. And if I showed you what they say, well, I mean, you could probably guess it's not a pretty sight, Ridwan. Well, thank you for, the, for, for, for telling us that. I mean, it's, it's really um, in the West, people have this, uh, people are often shocked when you tell them about these interactions that happen between, uh, between people and, and, and these, these opinions that people hold about different uh, groups of people. People are really shocked shocked by this although such things are completely normal to us i mean i don't want to go too deeply into this from my own side i sometimes tell people about how it was within my own family and uh you know family friends and all that but uh it was completely normal for my, i mean, I, I learned from my own parents that uh the jews are the worst things imaginable it, it, it is it is such a it makes such a psychological impact that the word Jew, when said in Arabic or in Turkish, Yehudi, is, is still, it carries such an undertone, such connotations. It's, I, I, still, I still feel like I'm saying something, uh, you know, worrisome when I pronounce that word. That's, that's the thing that's going on. You know, it's, it's, um, it was completely normal. Uh, for example, one gathering that I that I remember, just between my parents and uh, family friends, we are sitting there and they are talking about uh, the end times. You know, I, I come from a very religious family and very religious uh, family friends, and they're talking about the end times and about how uh, the 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 the, Jah, the Islamic version of the Antichrist, will come and uh, how he will be accompanied and followed by uh, a bunch of Jews. And uh, and I'm just sitting there and I'm not religious or anything uh, at at that point, and I think. I think to myself that I mean 
really you know all these things you know that all of these things will happen and they will happen just like that and and and, and what about the jews do they know that these things will happen so i, I actually loudly asked I, I said so what about the jews do you actually think that jews know about these things and what are they doing and um the family friend said something that is very popular among uh, in the Islamic world. He said, well, of course they know. Uh, of course they know. They are preparing for this. They know very well what will happen in the end, and they are preparing. They are uh, both afraid, and they are also plotting. If you go to Israel, you will see that... Uh, <laughs> You will see that the that the Jews are planting a certain tree, which is the Gargat tree, because they know very well that this tree will protect them from us when uh, when they will be fighting us and we will be, you know. This is the Hadith story. Look behind yeah. every tree, there's a Jew hiding. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Now, but of course, though, you because you don't speak Arabic, you must be misinterpreting the Quran. If only you spoke Arabic, oops, as I do then you would know that when the Quran says, kill, 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 take an espresso break, resume killing, what it means is kill with kindness, kill with love, kill with massages. So because you don't, you're not a philologist of Arabic, you are spreading mischief and fitna in society. Do better, good fun. <laughs> That was uh, beautifully put. This is why I invited you here, so that you can teach us, <laughs> teach yeah. us how to approach things uh, differently from a completely different perspective and to make everything beautiful again when everything is actually terrible. So <laughs> that's that's perfect. Uh, Coming to, uh, I want to get back to your book. I have it here, by the way, for all those who have not seen it at the beginning. The Parasitic Mind by Dr. Gadzad. It's a, it's a wonderful book. I really recommend uh, reading this. Uh, it's really, it, it includes much of what we just talked about. Uh, and there, there are a lot of references to, to Islam in it, which is very surprising to me because it doesn't primarily focus on Islam. But I can see why. And, uh, and also to a lot of uh, thought problems that spread in today's time, why people think very absurd things. And I want to get to that. Uh, you obviously have a very big passion for freedom. And I can see where that comes from. I can see how, uh, you know, Growing up in a very repressed, uh, repressive environment, in hiding and all that, might have given you might have given you an appreciation for freedom, and you very much expressed it in your book as well, right? I mean, that is one of the main motivators behind why you appreciate freedom so much. Yes, uh, th thank you for asking this question. Uh, I I state in chapter one that there are two life ideals that shape my life. It's the pursuit of truth and the defense of freedom. Uh, without these two things, then we are just, you know, nihilists. We are just anarchists where there's no logic or rhyme to anything. And so everything that I do in life is motivated by these two ideals. Now, of course, part of it stems from the tragic reality of my growing up and my childhood. But I also think it's just the random combination of genes that make up God Saad that make me who I am, right? In other words, I might have grown up in uh, beautiful Massachusetts. Uh, and yes, it would have been different in that I didn't experience all the horrors that I did. And I wouldn't have been as, you know, uh, exposed to what a, a society void of freedom would amount to. But I just, I just think that it's who I am. I'm, I'm personally injured by attacks on freedom, by distortions of truth. I, you know, oftentimes people ask me, well, you know, you seem like such a nice and affable person and a warm person. But sometimes on when we look at you on social media, you seem a lot more caustic and severe. Well, I'm not. I'm actually a very fun loving, very humorous, very affable guy. But whenever you see that, uh, you know, indignation come out out of me on social media, it's precisely because I simply can't bear that people could be so dishonest. I, I It's it's as if you could see a person flying uh, and it surprises you. I'm surprised by how diabolically dishonest and duplicitous people are, right? So I could sit down and be talking to a Muslim person who says, well, you don't know what's in the Quran. So then I can quote exactly what it is and I can quote it in Arabic, which they don't know. And they say, no, it's not true. So when you are so parasitized, such that we can't find a common decent place, an epistemological place of truth where we can agree 
that left is left, right is right, up is up, down is down, then it leaves you desperate. And so one of the reasons why I wrote The Parasitic Mind, one of many reasons, is that you know, I, I argue that I've seen two great wars in my life. The first great war is the one in Lebanon. The second great war is the war on reason, science, logic, common sense that I've seen in academia. I mean, it's simply unbelievable. And this is not strictly related to Islam issues, right? We can't agree on whether only women menstruate or whether sometimes boys menstruate, right? If I have to receive an email from people, adults, functioning adults, who write to me very politely, dear Professor Saad, you know, as an evolutionary behavioral scientist, you would be able to answer this question. Is it wrong for me to say that only women menstruate or has the that information changed now? Well, when someone is so insecure about their knowledge of the world that they have to write to a professor to know whether only women menstruate or sometimes men or women menstruate, then I need to be fighting against this. So yes, truth and freedom are the key drivers of life and uh, people should stand up and defend both it's worth it uh you argue a lot that uh, truth is very much being redefined and uh bent in today's time um and, and and you appeal very much to uh progressivism and um uh postmodernism in how um how postmodernism especially uh approaches reality in such a way that it's um that it depicts truth as entirely subjective uh so, something that is uh, true may not be true according to you. You can just simply, uh, you can make something else true by simply accepting that as true. You can say, I am uh, actually a uh, a woman. I am actually this tall. I'm actually of that race and of that origin. I am actually this and that. Uh, <laughs> is, is this something that you think is a, um, a very big problem in our time that uh, is a danger in, 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 a, in a sense, which is why you are speaking out against it? Or? It is. So look, in, in the book, uh, the reason why I talk, the reason why the book is called The Parasitic Mind, so maybe I can step back and just explain this a bit. So as an evolutionist, one of the things that I do or any evolutionist would do is to use what's called comparative psychology. Comparative psychology is where you look at other species and compare their behavior to humans to demonstrate that there is a common ancestry, right? So for example, if I show you that there is certain sex specific toy preferences that vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys have that, that are similar to human infants, then this shows you that there's probably some evolutionary and biological reason why boys prefer trucks and guns and why girls prefer dolls on average. So, as I was trying to understand why is it that human minds could be so parasitized by these dreadfully false ideas, I wanted to look for in the animal kingdom a, a, to draw an analogy. And so I got into the neuroparasitology field. Now, parasitology is simply the study of how, you know, the, the relationship between parasites and hosts. So for example, a tapeworm can parasitize a host in its intestinal tract, whereas a neuroparasite is a parasite that needs to end up in the host's brain, altering its neuronal circuitry to suit its interests, right? So the, whole, the, the parasite is parasitizing the mind, the brain of the host. And so I had my aha moment. I would use the neuroparasitological model to argue that humans could not only be parasitized by actual brain worms, actual parasites, but they could be parasitized by a second class of parasitic agents, which I called idea pathogens. Now, postmodernism, so to come to your question now more directly, postmodernism is the granddaddy of all idea pathogens because it removes our ability to even have an epistemology of truth, right? Now, Scientists can disagree about what is true or not. And scientists, what they thought was true 300 years ago is different than what they think is true today. That's why in science, we talk about provisional truth. We used to think that the sun revolves around the earth. Then the Copernican revolution came along. And now we don't think so. We, we know that the earth revolves around the sun. But we do think that there is a means by which we can access truth. Otherwise, there'd be no point getting up as a scientist every day to study anything because anything is, is subjective and relative and prone to personal biases. So, so postmodernism is the most dangerous of idea pathogens 
because it eradicates our ability to have sense making, right? If we can't agree that only women bear children, if we can't agree that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, now these both of these come from a story that happened in 2002 where I, myself and my former, so I had a doctoral student who had just defended his dissertation and he wanted us to go out to celebrate for dinner. So we were going out myself, him, my wife and his date. And so before we went out to dinner, uh, my, my doctoral student calls me up to give me a heads up to tell me that his date for the evening was a graduate student in postmodernism, in women's studies, and in cultural anthropology, to which I asked, I, I said, ah, okay, so the holy trinity of bullshit. Uh, and so, of course, the story was that, you know, he was trying to get me to, you know, promise that, you know, I would be on my best behavior. We just want to go out and have a nice time. To which I said, yes, yes, of course, I'm going to be on my best behavior, which of course was a complete lie. So about halfway through the evening, I asked the lady in question, you know, I hear you're a postmodernist, no universal truths, correct? And so that's when I asked her, is it true that only, is it not true that only women bear children? And so she scoffed at my stupidity and said, of course not. There's a tri Japanese tribe off some Japanese island where within their folkloric realm, within their myth mythological realm, it is the men who bear children. So by you restricting it to the biological realm, that's how you keep us, you know, barefoot and pregnant. Then I asked her, does the sun rise in the east and sets in the west? To which there she used deconstructionism, which is a mutant variant of postmodernism, where she said, what do you mean by east and west? And what do you mean by the sun, that which you call the sun? I could call dancing hyena. I said, well, fine. The dancing hyena rises in the east and sets in the west. And she said, I don't play those label games. So this was not, as I always remind people, this was not an escapee from a mental institution. She wasn't a psychiatric uh, uh, patient. Although, given the fact that she was studying postmodernism, you couldn't tell that she wasn't a psychiatric patient because we couldn't agree that only women bear children and that there is such a thing as east and west and the sun. So, of course, it's dangerous. Now, in a very small way, it's dangerous to the wallet, to the pocketbook of the parents who spent their lives uh, saving money to send their child to a $75,000 a year school where they learn this bullshit. What does that get you? Can you build better bridges with postmodernist physics? Can you cure cancer? Can you solve mathematics problems? Can you understand the human condition better? No, it's, it's exactly why I call it intellectual terrorism. While the 9-11 hijackers flew planes onto buildings, postmodernists fly planes of bullshit onto our edifices of reason. It's nihilistic. It's destructive. There is no, it's a Darwinian dead end. It leads you nowhere. So to answer your question in a very long winded way, yes, it's very dangerous and it needs to stop. It's it's a it's a it's a, an interesting perspective. It's like uh, it is not simply that people hold certain ideas that are unreasonable and uh, idiotic. I mean, the example that you gave uh, just now of that of that woman it sounds almost like a parody. It sounds like yes. it sounds like a parody account on Twitter saying all these things, but. Uh, it's, it's not just a person holding very absurd beliefs. It is also that these absurd beliefs are being normalized and then taught to uh, to you or, you know, forced on, onto you or taught to your children whom you want to bring up a certain way. So it's, it's a complete, um, it, it changes the entire environment that you live in and the future generation that you uh, hope for and, and, and raise. So in that regard, I can see where you perceive the danger. And I would add, I mean, to your point, when I would first, when I was first standing on top of the mountain, screaming and warning people about all of these idea pathogens, some other ones of which we might end up talking about social constructivism, militant feminism, cultural relativism, identity politics, biophobia, the innate fear of using biology to explain human behavior. These are all other, you know, uh, idea pathogens that I discuss in the book. Now, when I would first warn people about these things many decades ago, uh, people would say, up until now, well, come on, you're just coming up with extreme examples from some esoteric department in the humanities. That's not reflective of anything. And then I would always tell people, and it's turned out to be exactly right. I don't mean to be gleeful about saying I told you so. But just like the COVID virus, as far as we know, 
starts off in a lab, but then it breaks free of the lab, keeping us then prisoners for the next two years, these idea pathogens might start off in a quote lab in some humanities department. But eventually that those idea pathogens break out and they become someone called Justin Trudeau, right? So the prime minister of Canada, who's now been elected not once, not twice, but three times by completely lobotomized Canadians, uh, is a walking manifestation of every single one of those idea pathogens. Now, it's not because he, you know, he's an evil, diabolical villain. It's because he is a product of the educational system that he's been brought up in. And he has been brought up with each of those idea pathogens as the guiding framework by which you live life. Now, that guy escapes from the lab, becomes prime minister, and then I get to not be able to walk my dog outside after 10 o'clock because we all know that the COVID virus, if you walk your dog after 10 p.m., is very, very dangerous when you're walking alone in a neighborhood. So, so yes, these idea pathogens start off in esoteric bullshit academic departments, but wait enough time, they become prevalent in journalism, in human resource departments, in the military, in the FBI, in the university, it's everywhere. So uh, those of those folks who did not see that bad ideas are not restricted to a building in a campus are, are simply myopic. Yeah, there, there, there is a there is a part in um in, in your book where you are uh, lengthily discussing these things, and you're talking about a specific celebrity and her child. Uh, what was it, uh, Charlize oh, yeah. Theron? Uh, sorry, exactly. Oh, yeah, and and how she um has a I I can't exactly remember the roles or the actual uh, the actual gender that we are talking about, but uh, that her three year old child uh, makes a decision over what gender the child actually is, and she respects that decision and goes with it because it's you know, the, the, the the child knows best what gender that child is, right? Is, is that... all... I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, just, just, just correct me on that because that that just uh, brought something to my mind when, I, as I was reading that, which I thought was very messed up. Something that you didn't go into from that, but in connection to a child making such life changing decisions at the age of three, just made me think of something else that I um, am often confronted with. But was yeah. that right? As far as I captured that, uh, want... she, she, I think the child was about three. Uh, my point there, incidentally, is to demonstrate. The, the lack of cognitive consistency that stem from these idea pathogens. And let me, if I may just step back for a second and, and get technical for a moment. So when you study rational behavior, uh, so my doctoral dissertation was in psychology of decision-making. I studied, you know, how much information do people search before they stop and commit to a choice, okay? And so within this behavioral decision-making paradigm, one of the things that uh, one studies is axioms of rational choice. This is what typically economists study. So for example, if I prefer car A to car B, and I prefer car B to car C, then I must prefer car A to car C. That's a axiom of rational choice. If I violate that relationship, this is a this is called the transitivity axiom. It's a mathematical property. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, A must be greater than C. Now let's apply this framework to you know, the noble progressives, peace be upon them, because they're smarter and more moral than the rest of us, okay? Well, here's what Theron is saying. The three-year-old is sufficiently cognitively developed that when he or she says that they are in the wrong gender, you shut your mouth, transphobe, and you accept it. On the other hand, now let's talk about how they view age. If you are 17 years old, 364 days, therefore you didn't hit 18. Tomorrow you hit 18, but you're not yet 18. And you take out an insurance policy against your parents, kill them, and then recoup the insurance policy. Well, you can't really punish this person because they're just a child. We all know that their cognitive, their prefrontal <laughs> cortex doesn't develop till they're 25. So to punish this person, because I'm progressive, so I'm very, very kind and empathetic, to punish this person 
who's a child at seven, 17 years old, 364 days, is cruel. So on the one hand, from this side of my mouth, someone who's almost 18, who takes out an insurance policy on their parents should not be punished because they're a child. But on this side of the mouth, someone who's three years old and says, I am of the wrong, of the different sex is old enough, right? That's the kind of distortions you get when you are parasitized by idea pathogens. It's insane. Yeah, it it made me just think about um, something. I don't I don't know if I'm if I'm um, thinking about this uh, the right way or whether I should even be thinking about this. But obviously, because I'm talking so much about um, about Islam and Islamic culture and rulings and this and that, and I have a lot of back and forths with people, uh, you, you are probably aware of uh, one topic which concerns uh, child marriage <laughs> within within Islam, which is something that I happen to discuss very often with people. And uh, what we often say. Um, what which is established is that a child uh, is not capable of making a decision as you know as, as great as having sexual interactions with a with an older person or you know ha having sexual interactions in general not is, is not capable of these things is not able to make a uh, a, a, a decision like getting into a marriage with an older person and so on if we have a scenario of a 50 year old person marrying a six-year-old child for example we would say hey uh what the hell it is a six-year-old child a six-year-old child is not remotely capable of making such a life-changing decision and to go into such a uh, such a contract to you know <laughs> to dedicate herself to that but if we then want to accept that a three-year-old child can uh make a such a huge life-changing decision for herself and that we have to uh, simply accept that decision because the child knows best, knows better than us, then uh, doesn't that put in danger our entire idea of why child marriage is wrong? You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, uh, speaking of child marriages, honor killings, genital, female genital mutilations, uh, the, uh, the, noble, the noble prophet, uh, Justin Trudeau, peace be upon him, uh, when he was a member of parliament before he became prime minister, uh, the Harper government, so the previous government before Tr Trudeau had put out an edict that, you know, in Canada, we do not tolerate barbaric practices. And Justin Trudeau had come out with all of his training as a substitute drama teacher, which was the most prestigious job he had held up to that point. The most prestigious job he had held prior to leading one of the G8 countries was a substitute drama teacher, okay? So he, he feigned indignation, he was angry, and he was very upset that the Harper government would be using the word barbaric in describing child marriages, honor killings, and female genital mutilation. He wasn't upset by the barbaric actions or realities. He was upset that you would call them barbaric. And of course, here, what's the idea pathogen that is parasitizing his mind? It's cultural relativism, right? It's basically saying, who are you, bigot, to judge the cultural and religious traditions of another people? Which, which you might remember in the book, I talk about a, a case that arose with a former friend of mine, Sam Harris, who's apparently no longer a friend because, you know, I'm a mean guy who didn't hate Donald Trump enough and therefore I can't be part of his super cool Malibu cool skit party. But uh, when uh, Sam ha tells a great story, uh, which I quote at length in the book, where he is speaking to the a bioethicist uh, who was serving, I think, on President Obama's, uh, peace be upon him also, uh, who was uh, his uh, ethics committee or whatever it's called. And she was very much of a hardened cultural relativist. And Sam asked her, so what if there was a culture, I'm, I'm slightly, you know, pa paraphrasing the words, I don't remember the exact quote, but you can read it in the book. Uh, what if there was a culture that said for every fourth child, we must gouge their eyes so that they are blind, so that they can walk towards the light. And then she said, well, if that's their religious and cultural, then who am I to say? So this person who was sitting on a presidential ethics committee did not have the moral compass 
which we've all evolved to have through this little thing called evolution, she didn't have the moral calculus to say, what? You mean it would be okay to gouge the eyes of every fourth child so that they are blind? If she doesn't have the gumption to do that, then it shows you what happened to cultural relativism. It's insane. Yeah, it, it, it is such a uh, terrible position to hold, such an idiotic position to hold, and almost... Um, a bigoted position to hold, uh, a position where you where you where you ironically consider yourself superior and other cultures inferior, so much that you uh, would judge such things as terrible if your own people did that, because your own people, you know, are are advanced and they know better and all that. But if others do that, if other, you know, worse cultures, terrible cultures do that, then you, you just can't really judge them because they just don't know, and that's just what they do, and they just, you know, they just they just weird and <laughs> well you're fetishizing so i talk about this you're fetishizing the old jean-jacques rousseau noble savage idea right those people mm -hmm. those those wonderful brown people uh and in many cases they're not even brown but you know anybody who's not called uh john roscoe and from arkansas suddenly becomes brown right so those wonderful exotic brown people don't have it in them they couldn't know any better it's for us to teach those poor little people and you rub their head, right? It, it's, I think it was one of uh, George uh, Bush's uh, uh, speechwriters who coined the term, the soft bigotry of low expectations, right? So that's exactly what it is, right? Look, I, I'll tell you two quick stories about that. Uh, one of which I, maybe both I discuss in the parasitic mind. Uh, well, uh, one of them I discussed in the parasitic mind. The second one just happened recently. Uh, I was once sharing a clip of an Iraqi astronomer who was arguing that it's very clear the Quran says the earth is flat and here's the quote and so on. And so therefore, absolutely, the earth is flat. So I shared that and I, I just said, I mean, look what happens when a scientist, you know, has been infected with, you know, a religious doctrine. So a fellow academic of mine who's a, you know, white woman from Northern California, uh, writes to me, uh, not writes to me, I mean, writes on my, on, on the Facebook thread, something to the effect of, you know, why are you going after those people? Do you think that it's right to go after the marginalized people? To which I answered her, so you're not offended by a fellow scientist saying that the earth is flat. You're offended that I would point to him saying that the earth is flat. So imagine how bigoted she is to actually think that that Iraqi astronomer is not worthy of mockery and ridicule because, you know, he's just a poor Muslim. What would he know any better? Isn't that what bigotry is? The second story I was going to tell you just happened uh, yesterday, but I have a million others like that. I shared a photo of the uh, voluptuous Stacey Abrams. Do you know who that is? Uh, yes. Stacey Abrams is a noble woman of color, therefore she's right on everything because her skin you establishes whether you're right or wrong. I have lighter skin than Stacey Abrams, so we know that she must be right and I must be wrong. So she posted a clip of herself, uh, and now I'm just going to mention her weight. I didn't mention it in the tweet. I'm going to mention her weight because obesity is one of the main comorbidity factors related to a bad trajectory for COVID. So she weighs, I don't know, five, 600 pounds. And she is shown sitting down with a hundred kids behind her. All of the kids are fully masked like they are wearing the niqab, whereas she is without the mask. So I said, look at this noble woman of color who is doing this. So I got attacked by a million people, many of whom were also noble people of color. They weren't offended by the unbelievable cruelty and hypocrisy of her position. Young children can't breathe while I, 600 pounds, cannot wear a mask. They were offended that I would post this clip, which was a, which was a, tweet, a photo that she had posted and then deleted. So I was being misogynist and racist for sharing her photo. So imagine that this person operates in the real world. 
it's pretty scary, right, Ridvan? I mean, it's unbelievable. It is. It is. It is. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what to what to what to say any further. It's just what what surprises me is just that uh, the fact that you are also a noble person of color. Uh, so I don't know why people are uh, reacting to you. You can say whatever you want, and I can too. I'm also a noble person of color. And by the way, uh, using the uh, noble uh, victimology poker that they have instituted, I often use that, and it's just laughable to see how they wilt away. Right. So. All I have to do, let's say a, I see a journalist from Forbes magazine attack me. So then I feign, you know, that I'm hurt and all this. And I say, here I am, a war refugee, a person of color, an Arabic Jew. Why are you attacking me? The second she sees that, they panic so much because <laughs> they've been so inculcated with this calculus. They'll shut down their Twitter account. They'll put it under protected tweets. So... Uh, so imagine that we live in such a Kafkaesque world where when I am trolling your positions, you are so unsure of your principles that I simply say, are you aware that I'm a person of color according to your metrics? That's <laughs> it. I win the argument. I have to say nothing else. So the same thing, uh, something very similar happens when I uh, talk about my background with, uh, you know, how I learned hate in the Islamic culture and all that. So when I talk about something that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation, the whole, uh, you know, Jew hatred and how it is deeply ingrained and all that, uh, when I talk about these things, I am often, um, you know, uh, people of, uh, you know, of, of, of Western European uh, origin from America uh, of atheistic, uh, you know, backgrounds often respond to me and accuse me of bigotry and hate and all that. But uh, you know, when when you bring forth, when I bring forth my my background that I am actually uh, a former Muslim and my parents are Muslims and I come from this culture, then they are quiet and go away. So that that that's just how it goes. Apparently, uh, we have. Yeah, go ahead. Finish your work. No, apparently we have more right to say something about about these things just because of uh, for the merit of our, you know, I don't know, our, our 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 color or our origin or whatever it is. Exactly right, and I, I was I was going to say that in the case of Stacey Abrams, the fact that I wasn't black meant that I couldn't attack a black woman, right? So so it's literally you have to basically check what on the continuum of skin colors. You have to check what your skin color you is. And based on that classification, that determines what whom you can criticize. So it's perfectly fine to criticize someone who is white or who is a who is a brown person, but lighter than me. But mm -hmm. if they score darker than me, then shut your mouth, Jew boy. You don't have a right to speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I find very surprising in your book is that um, I actually honestly found that very surprising. So I, I really liked uh, how your book approaches things. And I, I like how often you bring up things that uh, I talk about quite uh, frequently. Uh, one thing is, um, I think, I believe in chapter six, you go deeply into, you say a, a, a phrase, I'm not sure how exactly it was, but uh, you talk about antithetical, um, you know, ideas to, to Western values. And you mentioned that uh, Islamic law, Sharia is like the ultimate form of exactly that and then you go uh, deeply into discussing certain details of uh, islamic law uh concerning how people are um treated completely differently based on uh their religious backgrounds and also based on uh, their gender for example such as that uh, killing a muslim requires uh you know uh, retaliation or something in exchange uh whereas killing a jew does not uh and, and things like these it was very surprising to me that you actually <laughs> that you actually discussed these things so so deeply how come how come you give that example well because uh so, several reasons, one of which is uh, whenever you see uh, either Westerners or Islamic folks get on TV and either by ignorance or due to duplicity, they espouse some positions that are so laughably false that if the journalists had the most basic understanding of the phenomena that were being discussed, they would say, what the hell are you talking about, moron? So example, there was a time when, uh, I don't remember his name, the, the imam that was trying to build a Islamic center right next to uh, the Twin Towers. 
uh, he would go on on every show and say Sharia law and Americans jurisprudence you can't tell them apart they're so similar they're exact I mean they I mean they're the same I can't tell them apart they're the same you believe in one you believe in the other okay so I'm sitting there and I'm almost hyperventilating I'm saying what I understand why he's doing it, but the person who is interviewing them, do they not have the journalistic duty, if not the journalistic integrity to, to be prepared for this? And so, so it's, that's one example where the imam is giving his BS. But the other example is when I'm interacting with, with Westerners who say, oh, you know, Shari I mean, look, one of the justices of in the, sitting in the Supreme Court, uh, he, who's, I think, a, a Jewish woman, was saying, oh, we've learned so much. I mean, the is Islamic law, Sharia law, has brought so many things to our thinking. And so I said, you know what? Let me explain to you what Sharia law is. So that was kind of the impetus because there what I'm doing is I'm explaining the concept of ostrich parasitic syndrome, right? Ostrich parasitic syndrome is the, 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 the malady that I have coined for people, you know, being parasitized by nonsense and doing the la, 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 I don't want to hear that what reality is, right? Uh, or the metaphor of the ostrich burying the her, its head in the sand to ignore reality. So the truth is so different than what is being expo espoused that you know it needed to be told. So it, it's and and to add to what you're saying, Ridvan, it's it's not just you know if if you kill a Muslim, it's this, but if you kill a Jew, it's that. We have it down to fractional values. I could tell you a. Uh, this guy is worth three eighths. This one is worth. So I have it down to a fractional science. Now, what is the most fundamental concept of American jurisprudence? That Lady Justice is blind. Is blind to what? It's blind to the identity of the perpetrator and the victim. So, contrary to the Imam of bullshit. Not only is Sharia law not anything like American jurisprudence, you couldn't create a system that was more different. That's why I wrote that section. That is that is uh, very good. I, I want to tell you uh, just one very short thing, very short uh, lived experience from my side. So I, I grew up in Germany. Um, I lived there for quite a long time, went to school there. At the age of uh, 16 or so, we moved to uh, Turkey, uh, which I really did not want. And I didn't like living there. I hated it, to be very honest. I always wanted to uh, go back, wasn't allowed and all that. But uh, many, many years later, I found my way of you know freely uh, visiting Germany again and going to my old um, school that I left uh, in eighth grade. And I really uh, liked that school. And I, I, I liked the director, who was a very nice woman, who would uh, help me a lot when I uh, was not, not really a, a good student. So um, I went there, visited my director, sat down with her. She was uh, very surprised to see me, very happy. We're talking. And uh, she said, "So, what did you miss the most, uh, or uh, what makes you want to, you know, visit your old home the most?" And I said, "You know what? I'm, I, ju I just, I love the tolerance here." And she said, "Yes, the tolerance." And <laughs> notice, I said, "I love the tolerance here." And then we are talking, and sh what she tells me is, "I am glad that things are really changing here for the better as well, and that we are uh, opening our." doors and making everything available for those who are uh, less fortunate because let's be honest um, everyone should partake in our uh, society and um, take what we have taken for granted because uh, it is we should no longer be living off the back of others at the expense of others so um i hope that our future will be better and i'm just sitting there and uh, i just took all of that in which what she what she said and i thought to myself wait a minute what the hell i just <laughs> I just said I, I just said I don't like the tolerance over there, and I like the tolerance uh, in here. And then she's uh, giving me this whole idea of you know, well you know now we are taking everybody in and opening our borders and making everything uh, open for them, and things will get better now because uh, we have been so bad, and you know we sh we should give everything to those people. And I just I just thought I, I couldn't make the connection between how is she even thought that would be a good response to what I just said. I mean, it yeah, doesn't, it 
doesn't really connect, right? So I I just all I wanted to do was just to be quiet, not respond. I thought I didn't come, come here to, to discuss, to engage in a heated debate. I came here to just uh, see the people that I missed for a long time. But then I know we, we, we chatted online uh, together. We messaged each other and she kept telling me how uh, much she wants people like uh, less fortunate people to come more and more into the country and to benefit from everything freely. And I just thought, man, what a delusion. I don't understand. Well, it's, it's a form of orgiastic pathology of guilt right it's i am born therefore i'm guilty and so it's taking the christian you know concept of original sin but applying it in an even more diabolical way right so i'll give you a few examples that support your your you know wonderful wonderful your your tragic story uh, uh there was a case of a I can't remember if he was, I think he was Norwegian. Maybe it could have been Norwegian. It could have been Swedish, uh, where a man was raped by a noble uh, Somali uh, refugee. So a male on male rape. And then when he had to go and testify the, the victim, he was very, very, uh, he felt very guilt ridden because in him testifying it there could be the chance of the somali guy after he serves you know a week in prison uh, will be deported and it was wrong of him to do this <clears throat> so now imagine imagine the instinct that most people would feel if they were raped they probably wouldn't be sitting pathologizing about their guilt vis-a-vis -vis the rapists but when you're able to convince a whole civilization that you being raped is a manifestation of how bad you are and you should apologize to the rapist, then all Darwinian mechanisms that shape our instinctual drives have gone out the window. Hence, it's parasitic, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. by the way, I'll tell you something that speaks to, to rape that you might find interesting given your, your interest on your channel. When I speak to people in Arabic and they don't know, I mean, now it's kind of harder for them not to know about me, if only because a lot of people know about me. Uh, but the typical imagery that they use is they say the West is a woman to be mounted, right? It's a very, right? So you mount her, you yeah. take her, right? Uh the Westerners who are going welcome refugee might want to revisit somebody. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I am the product. I don't need to be lectured about the value of empathetic uh, immigration policies. I am a product of immigration. I would have been dead if, if someone didn't open their door to me and treat me generously. So I'm all for letting in people. But the second you come in to my home, to my country, I get to decide whether the values that you're bringing in are those that we will tolerate or not. And if part of the deal is you come into our country, no female genital mutilation of five-year-old girls. If yes, you agree to that, come in, my brother, let's, let's grow together. If not, don't let your ass hit your, don't let the door hit your ass on the way back to wherever you came from. That's not bigoted. That's called in Arabic, having shakhsiyya, you have a personhood, you have a spine, right? I have honor. I defend my home. I defend my children. I defend my country. It doesn't make me virtuous to say I'm going to tolerate the intolerable, as Karl Popper says. On the contrary, what makes me virtuous is to say, no, there are some things here that I will never tolerate. If you accept it, come in. If no, stay away. I mean, if, if I say, hey, I do not want child marriage in this country, if that's okay for you uh, and you come here, do not bring child marriage into this country. What I'm doing is essentially I'm looking out for the safety of, uh, of, of the people that I know, of the, of the people around me. I'm looking out for the safety of my community and I'm even looking out for the safety of you if you want to be part of this. And I, I am also an immigrant, by the way, in America. So I also benefited from that. I'm in no way against that. But uh, I mean, it should be a given that uh, if you want to uh, go to a different environment and uh, be a part of that environment, you should not uh, you should agree to not bringing certain practices there that are considered destructive, that are simply not part of that environment, that are hated. Female genital mutilation, rape, uh, child marriage, 
I don't know, wife beating. Many of these things uh, could, could be counted to that. Can I ask you a question, if I may? Sure, go ahead. What is it that you think in you that allowed you to break free of your shackles? And the reason why I ask this is because as a psychologist, I'm interested in uh, synthesizing that and putting it in a bottle so that I can spray it on people and they can also be uh, dewormed, if you'd like. Because, you know, again, uh, the, the statistical probability of you coming from the background that you come from and then saying, sorry, I'm not having any of this, is very low. So what is it? Is it just the random combination of your genes? Is it a particular episode? Maybe you could tell us about it. I, I do think about that quite often. Uh, maybe you should invite me to your to your show. <laughs> I would uh, I would appreciate that. But um, I mean, I do think about that very often. I guess it's a combination of different um, I don't know uh, factors. Uh, maybe a result of a series of events in my life. Maybe something to do with my childhood. I just think I have always had a very uh, curious questioning attitude, and I think there is one big factor, which is that. Uh, living in Germany, I I was very much in love with uh, the way people in Germany thought and saw each other, how people were equal and um, didn't have these, un didn't have this, this, you know, these, this bunch of unnecessary borders between, between genders and people of different kinds and all that. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed being able to uh, have a creative mind and to think and say whatever I want. Then moving to Turkey, I saw that everything is extremely repressive talking to the other gender is always a huge problem you could get in trouble very easily and all that uh creativity is not valued at all i guess the contrast in that made me just long for what i uh learned to love at the very beginning and maybe just that maybe it is really just that that helped me uh you know break free and think differently and appreciate these values so much that I want to uphold them and protect them and believe in them. Well, that, you know, I tell you, I mean, it, it, in speaking to you and speaking to countless other Muslims and ex-Muslims, I mean, I, I, I have more friends who are of that religion than most people will ever uh, have hair on their head. So that's why I don't like when people, you know, tell, oh, are you being Islamophobic? I, come on. Uh, I judge people on the merits and the totality of merits and flaws of their character. So I, I'm, if I put Ridvan through a values machine and I see that his values are consistent with the, the values of the West, then I'm much more likely to support him coming into our country, even though he's Muslim. I don't give a damn that he's a Muslim. Whereas I might say, here is this Orthodox Jew. I mean, yes, he may not blow up stuff, but maybe he holds certain values. Let's assume that he did that he holds certain values that are contrary to our common values in the West, well, then my vote goes for Ridvan or the Imam of Peace, if you know who it is, Imam Tawhidi, who is, uh, you know, a, 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 a very, uh, you know, practicing Muslim. I share a lot more in common with him than I might with a lot of the Orthodox Jews that live, you know, in, you know, about 20 minutes from here, even though I'm Jewish. So imagine the difference in mindset, right? I could be closer to a Muslim, given my background, than I would be to a Jew. Why? Because I'm completely not parasitized in the least bit by tribal thinking. I judge each individual on their merits and flaws. Whereas yesterday, when people got angry at me for criticizing Stacey Abrams, all that they saw is they're black. I'm criticizing a black person, black, black, no, therefore my position is wrong. So that's why identity politics is another one of those incredibly corrosive idea pathogens because Lebanon, just like you just gave the example of how you went to, to Germany and to Turkey and how this may have shaped your trajectory. Well, the reason why I tell the story of my Lebanese background is because I lived what happens to a society that is perfectly organized according to identity politics lines, right? So when you now have in the West the ethos of identity politics, I come along and say, oh, that's what you're looking for? Well, I'm going to show you the perfect model of identity politics. What's the end trajectory? Forget about the Balkans. Forget about 
the Iraq sectarian war, forget about Rwanda, go to Lebanon and see what happens when everything is judged through the prism of which tribe you belong to. It never leads to a good place. So, you know, it's just unbelievable yeah. that all of these lessons are lost on these ultra noble and empathetic and progressive. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Before we end this, I really um, want to read a few uh, comments here and super chats. There are some comments for you, some questions for you. I would like to uh, address that as well. But thank you so much. Uh, God, I really appreciate oh, uh, everything so far, by the way. Uh, so um, I saw quite a few comments that said <laughs> that said something like this. The horror of life. Kim said, Godfather, why are you so ruggedly handsome and intelligent? Ah, very good. Uh, would it have heard you to add sexy and sensual to that list, please? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why am I so uh, that is that's that's the beauty of evolution. It takes the genes of each parent, it combines them, and then you get this creation in front of you. I it's only evolution. I can't blame it on anything else. That's a very fair response. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh Hindu historian made a super chat and said, I love your book, Dr. Saad. Thank you so much. As I don't know if you know this, and forgive me for I don't mean to to toot my horn, but since since the 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 name of the person or the the handle is Hindu historian, uh, just two weeks ago I was uh, amazingly astonished and humbled when the Prime Minister of India sent me a personal letter of appreciation. That's truly one of the highlights. It shows you what happens when you get out of the academic lane that you're supposed to be in, right? I mean, I could have just had a very successful career as an academic and just do my research and so on. And that's great. And I continue to do that. But expanding, building bridges to the greater public, you know, coming on these shows, do you know, interacting with people can get someone as politically powerful as the prime minister of the you know, biggest democracy in the world to pay attention, that really humbled me. So there you go. So thank you. I, I, I saw I saw the news of that. That was uh, quite impressive, really. <laughs> it was nice, yeah. Uh, Secular Sikai made a super chat, unfortunately, a, a super sticker. Unfortunately, I cannot see it here, but thank oh. you so much. Uh, Nikolaus and Ruprecht said, thank you for scheduling this so that Europeans can watch you live. This is oh. the best time. It's very nice. Great. Thank you for being here. Um, Silver LTC said, AP, could I please get your opinion on the hypocrisy of Sura 1099 asking for a friend? I can look into that at a separate time. I believe it's talking about uh, something like if Allah wanted everyone to believe, they would believe or something like that. I did talk about that several times. I will do so again in the future. I'll make a note. Thank you. Uh, Zero Miro said, uh, awesome guest. Thank I you. Know. Thank you for the kind words. I know. I appreciate that too. Juna Birchwater said, great chat, Redwan and Dr. Gad Saad. Thank you. Uh, Sid Dave said, Muslims are the biggest proponents of secularism when in minority, but support Sharia in majority. They always join leftist party in their own host country. It's something that is quite common. I don't want to generalize now, but I see what you are talking about given certain statistics. Yeah. Well, that, by the way, that's that's exactly the the historical mechanism of the Meccan versus Medinan period, right? When you are in the minority and you have few followers, preach peace and love and let's hold hand and sing John Lennon. When you are in the majority, show no mercy and you know smite them at their necks. It's an old playbook. That's funny. I was just you know, I'm, I started imagining Muhammad and his companions singing "Imagine" together. <laughs> um, he said it. He said about Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> that threats please to Ridvan. Yeah, Doctor God said didn't say anything. You can direct everything at me. I take full responsibility. <laughs> Sandy seventeen oct said, "AP, can you use your superpowers to oust Erdogan from Turkey? It seems he's ruining a perfectly liberal state, especially with the alliance with Muslim Brotherhood." Love your videos, thanks. Um, honestly, even if I had superpowers, I would not bother about Turkey anymore. I just, <laughs> I just left it behind. I can't be bothered by that anymore. Wow. Yeah. Are your parents still in Turkey? They are still, yeah. But do they get any flack for their evil son's behaviors? Um, they don't tell me anything about it as far as I, I don't know, I don't know, but I guess people just ask them and it feels very awkward for them. 
right. and they yeah i don't have very much contact as much as i used to due to the given circumstances Laura Mesara said, I love Gatsad, very brave person. I love AP. What a great combination. They give me hope for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate appreciate it. Uh Whoopi Goman said, please make him say shout out to Montreal. Oh, okay. Well, I am in Montreal, but shout out to Montreal. So sure. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Pine Creek said, Pine Creek has his own uh, YouTube channel, very nice guy, said, the shade of your skin is not a good indicator of critical thinking. A black female lesbian can be very smart or very stupid. Oh, that is absolutely wrong. I learned in my cognitive studies at Wellesley College when I was majoring in women's studies that a black female lesbian is inherently smarter than you, period. So that's wrong. Yeah, and how dare you, Pine Creek, say such a ridiculous thing here. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, um, Sandy 17 Oct again said, AP, what is Islamophobic about saying not to kill people for blasphemy? Seems a fairly reasonable ask to me. Dr. Saad, always a pleasure to hear you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, it is Islamophobic because uh, if you criticize people's values, even if they call for your killing, then you are simply Islamophobic and bigoted. That should be. Known. Incidentally, before you read the next one, uh, you may or may not know this, but I, I suspect that you would, uh, Ridvan. There are many, many uh, commentaries coming from noble people of the noble faith who basically argue that when they are killing you, that is actually an act of mercy. Yes. Right? So the actual killing of you, where they separate your head from the rest of your body, they can't understand how you would you know, be angry about that when it is such a merciful act. I want to play you a clip in a in a, in a in a in a few seconds. Maybe if you have a little bit more time, just to get your opinion on something, if you are okay with that. Okay, go for it. Uh, but before that, um, Muslims support leftist Congress in India, Democrats in the U.S., Trudeau in Canada, Macron in France, but Erdogan in Turkey, MBS in Saudi, Imran Khan in Pakistan. Yeah, I mean, people always go for what is in their best interest, right? I mean, people are motivated by self-interest. And if it is in your own best interest or in the best interest of your own group to uh, choose a specific candidate or a specific ideology or party in Europe, but a completely different one in your home country, then that is probably what you will end up doing. And that is what people frequently do, as I have experienced as well. Uh, unless you want to add anything to that, good. Uh, you're good. Okay. Now I want to, um, as, as I mentioned before, uh, I just want to play, uh, two, a few little clips just to get your idea on whether you think these are good ideas or bad ideas and whether criticizing these is, is, uh, freedom or bigotry. Let, you can always let me know if you think you don't want to react or say anything about these things. Um, all right. Let me know if you can hear this. I can't hear it. You can't hear it? No. Okay, you can't hear it. Uh, fine, let's uh, see. I saw him moving, but I couldn't hear anything. Oh, well. Huh. I think I should be able to then. Part of a religion, there's a reason to it. Yeah, there's a reason why there's a capital punishment because people like you, little weaklings who leave their religion and cause uh, corruption in the land by spreading it, the capital punishment in Islamic law would be applied to you. We have no doubt and we're proud of that. Yeah, capital punishment will be applied in an Islamic state. Yeah, not individuals going and doing it themselves like uh, idiots. Yeah, no, under an emir. It is done, yes, and we, you know what, we'll be watching. The right of the community is greater than you individual wanting your right to freedom, which is BS, absolutely BS. So what do you think so far about this? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, well, you know what I think, but uh, I, I would say that maybe I could add a little uh, uh, value to that clip. The I can I, his name uh, escapes me right now, but the oh Al, Al, Al Karadawi, the 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 head of the you know arguably the the most senior Sunni cleric from Al Azhar University in Egypt and so on said that uh, 
if it weren't for the uh, death penalty for apostasy, Islam would not have survived. So mm -hmm. it's it's a very good marketing ploy. You need to buy my product or else I kill you. You need to not buy another product or else I kill you. That's a wonderful marketing message. It works well. That's why it Islam has 1.4 billion people, whereas Judaism is a very, very bad marketing religion. It only has 14 million people. Yeah, fantastically put. Well, this guy is, uh, resides in the UK and has a YouTube channel that has 700,000 subscribers. More than me and you combined. Yes, yes. And also what I did was just to find out what happens, uh, since people got in trouble for criticizing Islam and all that in the UK, I reported this to uh, to the... To the uh, to the, to the police to see uh, what's going on because these people were really going very crazy and making like uh, you know targeted harassment and threats and all that. I communicated with the with the local police in his uh, environment in the the Metropolitan Police in London. What they told me is that they don't see an issue with his speech because uh, it was obviously uh, simply a heated debate in which he said things that he feels very passionate about, there which is go. why they can't blame him for saying something. Absolutely, uh, can't blame him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the next thing is we basically talked about this but uh, here's a, 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 a popular Islamic apologist he says I love how so many of these Islamophobes don't have the ability to represent me fairly by calling this child rape how is it child rape when there is parental consent uh, <laughs> exactly exactly that, that makes total sense this guy should be on the Supreme Court. Is there a way we can get Biden to nominate him? I will try to find out. But, okay. uh, he has to self-identify as a black woman. If yes, then Biden. Because Biden explained to us that what matters is that you have a particular genitalia and a particular skin tone. That's what he's going to use to hire, I mean, to appoint the next uh, justice. So if this guy can do that, we might have found our next justice of the United States. That is fantastic. So you say this is in completely in alignment with our current popular ideas in the West? Well, right? exactly, because we know that Sharia law is perfectly consistent with American Western jurisprudence. You can't tell them apart. So this seems to make perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. I really appreciate that. Next, we have uh, this one. Uh, the, uh, Mohammed Hijab is a popular Muslim apologist. He was actually on the jo Jordan Peterson podcast and had a conversation with him about. Oh, I heard about this. OK, that's the yeah. guy. OK. Yeah, yeah, you should you should really review that. That would be fantastic. Oh, he okay. says, "I believe certain anti-Muslim women would wish they believe they lived in the medieval period, a period where if a war was won by the opposing side, it was conventional that people could be taken as booty." Some historical accounts actually say some women would dress up for the captor. So, uh, <laughs> you know what? You know what I love about this is that we live in an era now where people are emboldened to say these things out loud, right? Where you can take a screenshot of it, right? This guy didn't say, you know what? I better not write this. It seems wrong. So in a sense, it's great, but in a sense, it's tragic. It's great because we get to see the, the, the stuff that they think. It's tragic in that the fact that he is emboldened to advertise this shows you how far the parasitic slope we've gone. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for your input. And finally, uh, law is superior. Okay. Sharia uh, law is superior to human rights because Sharia rule preserves marriage and family. Both Islam and human rights are in 100% agreement that women are accountable if they break the law, and that means Islam and human rights are in 100% agreement that women should be beaten. You have to give managers in these corporations the right to beat their employees. How do you beat your employees? Well, if the employee violates the norms of the workplace, they get fired. And if they do not voluntarily comply, security will be call, called to remove them by force. Managers have to have the right to beat their employees. There you go. You see how both systems are perfectly consistent with each other? Is it the sixth or seventh amendment of the United States Constitution that says, please feel free to beat your wife and or your employees? It's right there in the U.S. Constitution. So Sharia Allah, again, perfectly consistent. Now watch, somebody's going to take this clip, play it, <laughs> not put it as though I am being sarcastic. Anyways. Okay, and here's our final clip. Uh, this is from uh, the same guy that we just... I believe watched. that slavery is, uh, is, is an ideal system, that there should be slaves in a society. Do you think slavery is okay? Yeah. 
I mean, slavery is something that um, I do not find to be immoral. Is there really a fundamental difference between wage labor and slave labor? Is there is there a difference between owning someone versus renting someone? Renting someone is worse because think about the difference between owning a car and renting a car when you. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. I mean, it's look, look, what's amazing, by the way, is that it, it, and this is not only specific to Islam, it's specific. It, it's it, it holds true for all religions. It, right. What is the definition of, of, of religious faith is that you suspend reason and you jump into the pool of faith. Right. I mean, that's the definition. That's that's the that's the tension between faith and reason. Right. I believe, therefore, it, I don't activate my reason. Right. So now why am I saying all this? Because I could bring you 25 different imams, all of whom have the imprimatur of Al-Azhar University, which is the top you know, clerical place for Sunni Islam. And they will come up with all sorts of mental gymnastics to argue against this guy. Right. So so they right? Oh, no, there is no. There is no enmity against the Jews in the Quran. And whenever you see it, it's because you didn't understand it. And it's the stuff that I was talking about earlier when I joked about kill, kill, kill means to kill with kindness, right? So, and this, of course, is not specific only to Islam. So, for example, if I go to a rabbi, I say, hey, rabbi, in the, I don't know if it's in Deuteronomy, I can't remember which one it is, where you, you take your insolent children to the gates of the city and you stone them to death. Mm -hmm. That can't be a good moral code, Rabbi, right? I mean, we can't put all of our eggs into that moral code, right? No, no, you don't understand because the stone, it means that it's a stone of love. It means, right? So so that's what happens when you leave the epistemology of science and reason. You could, I could look in any of these holy books and prove to you that God loves gays or I could look in those books and tell you that God despises gays. I can do all sorts of mental contortions to come up with whatever conclusion I want to reach. That's why instead of being parasitized by uh, religious moral codes, we have within us an innate moral compass that has been endowed upon us through millions of years of evolution. Listen to that voice. Don't rely on any holy books. Very nicely put. Very nicely said. Thank you so much. Uh... God, the My doctor pleasure. God. Uh, really I really cool. appreciate is, is there anything else that you want to add that you want to share with our audience before? We uh, end? I, I, I guess I would say I'll give you a compliment. It takes a lot of guts to do what you do. I always tell people, please activate your inner honey badger. It's something that you've done without needing to read chapter eight of my book. I think that if more people were to activate their inner honey badgers and contribute to the battle of ideas, we could win many of these battles today peacefully because tomorrow we will fight them but it won't be peacefully so the choice is really ours either we have these nice conversations peacefully or we will fight street to street tomorrow thank you so much that was really really very well put and as said again uh the parasitic mind dr gatsad's book which we uh, very much discussed today there is so much more in this i only wanted to go into specific uh, aspects of it uh i read it through and listened to it very quickly so i would always suggest uh you get the book and go through it it's very, very good and very much appreciated. And I think you're working on another book right now, right? I'm working on my next book right now, which is a book, uh, I mean, tentatively titled A Recipe for the Good Life. Uh, of course, many people have written about this. Here, what I do is I bring my own personal background to that story backed up with science. So people say, how come you always seem to be smiling and joyful, even when you're dealing with serious issues? You always seem to have this kind of positive, affable quality about you. Well, read my next book and you'll find out how you can get there. Do you also tell people how to be good looking? Or? That one is a bit tougher because most of it, unfortunately, is restricted by genes. But there's certainly, <laughs> listen, I lost 85 pounds and I think I'm probably more desirable today than when I weighed 250 pounds. So there are some things you could change about your looks and other things you can't, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Gatza. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. For, for watching. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a fantastic day, and I will see you again uh, very soon. Cheers. All right.